grew up in a family here in Georgia, a family of field laborers. And uh, as a young person, he joined the civil rights movement as a teenager. And then he was arrested fleeing a demonstration. He survived a near lynching at the hands of law enforcement and spent seven years on chain gangs. At the time, he met his future wife, Patsy. Years later, at the age of 51, and with Patsy's encouragement, he started drawing and painting scenes from his youth using leather tooling skills that he learned in prison. When he died earlier this year, the New York Times said, carving figures into leather, a craft he had learned in prison, he recreated vivid scenes from his life of picking cotton, being lynched, and busting rocks in prison stripes. His art told the story of Jim Crow South. I am pleased tonight that we are, we are really just very fortunate to have Patsy Rembrandt with us to talk about her husband, talk about the times, and also Aaron Kelly, a philosophy professor from Tufts University who, who worked with Renfred to get his story into print. Professor Kelly teaches and writes about ethics and criminal law, social justice. She's the author of a book about criminal justice, The Limits of Blame, which really applies here because we're talking about criminal justice and the way uh, life was in the Jim Crow South. Finally, when we were scheduling this program and thinking about who the best person to talk to Patsy and Aaron would be, WABE's Lois Reitzes was the first name that came to my mind. She's been hosting radio programs in Atlanta since 1979. I think that's the longest of any <laughs> single person hosting, hosting radio here. I was a toddler. I toddled <laughs> up to the microphone. <laughs> Her current, her current program, City Lights with Lois Wrights, this is a weekday arts and culture program that covers uh, theater, dance, pop culture, visual arts, and more. And, and when Lois said yes, I was just thrilled. So I am going to sit back and be part of the audience for the next uh, hour and just listen to this conversation. So Lois, Patsy and Aaron, I'll leave it to you. Uh, we are so glad to have all of you here tonight. Thank you, Tony. And I can't tell you what an honor it is to be chosen for this book. I will never forget this story. In his foreword to the book, Brian Stevenson of the Equal Justice Initiative said that the life of Winfred Rembert is ultimately about love, a love for justice, a love of community and family, and a love of art that Winfred Rembert could transcend the re repeated brutality he endured and still have room for love is stunning. Patsy, in the memoir, your husband credits you entirely for turning his stories into art. And for that, you have thanks from countless admirers of his artwork now and for future generations. Erin, would you tell how this memoir unfolds? It's a story of Winfred's life. It's told from his perspective and in his voice, starting from early in his life where he works in the cotton fields at the side of his great aunt, Lillian Rembert, who raised him. Um, he was denied an education and eventually fled from the cotton fields to discover a black community in Cuthbert, Georgia. He gets involved in the civil rights movement, um, is arrested, and um, nearly lynched and spends the next seven years on chain gangs. Um, surprisingly, he's released since his sentence was 27 years. He doesn't know why he was released, but he was. And um, he and Patsy, whom he had met while he was on the chain gang, married. 
and eventually uh, moved north um, to New Haven, Connecticut, where they raised a family. And as you pointed out earlier, Patsy encouraged Winfred to tell his life story on leather, to carve and tell his life story as pictures <clears throat> on leather, which he did. Hmm. It is to your credit, Erin, that the memoir reads as though the artist is speaking directly to us. In fact, I felt, I felt like he was sitting next to me, talking to me about his past. How did you achieve that intimacy with the reader? I spent a lot of time with Winfred and Patsy in their home, listening, listening to what Winfred had to say, recording the conversation, going over what he had talked about with him, writing it up in his voice and having him correct it and go more deeply into the story. It was very important that it be Winfred's voice and that we take the time to tell the story. I told Winfred right at the beginning, we're gonna take as much time as you need to tell, to tell your story. So um, take, take time to get into the details and go where you want to with the story. And that's what we tried to do. Oh, I think it's admirable that, that he comes through and his voice. And uh, you took that as told to roll very seriously about honoring his story. There's heartbreak at the very beginning when Winfred says his mother gave him away at three months old. And he talks about longing for the togetherness of families. Patsy, would you talk about the painting that appears early in this portion of the book, the beginning? Well, Winford had a problem with being given away after he learned that he was given away. Uh, the thought entered his mind that he wasn't wanted. And that picture that he did was showing that he was being given away and he couldn't quite understand why his mother would give him away. And his father was nowhere to be seen. But as we went on in life, I tried to explain some things to Winfrey about that situation. It was a unsafe venture that his mother had entered into. And it's a long story, but she really didn't have a choice. She already had a child and she had to either give him up. And at the time she was only 22. And Winfrey did, just couldn't understand why would a mother give her child away? But she didn't have a choice. Me and held the, the property rights, uh, all of the money, where she lived, her husband was in the army. And uh, at this time, I don't know the true story, but she was behind the eight ball, so to speak. She mm -hmm. had no choice. But mm -hmm. that painting is so powerful. It's from a little boy's perspective, the feeling that he conveys. And I read he didn't want to touch it until he felt he could do a really good job. And that was at age 74. Yeah. There was no animosity that he held. It was just a pain of feeling unwanted. The paintings of Cottonfield Rose, titled The Overseer on Mama's Cotton Sack and Kink to Kink, are shocking in the ways they reveal how little had changed since slavery, but they depict scenes from the late 1940s and 50s. Would you talk about how Winfred conveys his impressions of cotton? Well, cotton is a beautiful thing if you're not working in it. It's okay to look at. It's just not okay to work in. And he could see the beauty and all the things that he'd done, even 
when it was a tragedy, he could find a way to bring the beauty from whatever he was doing. Because that's what he was about. Love and happiness is what he wanted. Mm. And he could uh, find a way to do it through his painting, his work. Oh, my, but his description of working in the cotton fields is harrowing. I was appalled to read that women who gave birth in the cotton field were expected to return to work immediately. Many of them did. Many oh. of them did. And <laughs> you find it hard to believe or understand, but they didn't have a choice. Oh, I don't, I don't doubt that. I, they didn't I, have a choice. I guess with almost every story that is told in the book, I'm astonished at the level of inhumanity, of the meanness. It, when it, the subtitle says a memoir of the Jim Crow South, I think that this is a very important history book as well as a memoir and beautiful art book. How old was Winfred when the plantation owner decided he was ready to pick cotton? Oh, about six. And what impact did that have on the little boy's life? He couldn't go to school. He couldn't really go to school and learn. Had he went to school, I don't, I don't know whether I would have met him. <laughs> but um, he couldn't go to school. He didn't learn how to read and write. Well, That's then, where artistic kicked in. He could only uh, put things together and make stuff from nothing. And uh, it gave him an outlet to do his frustration. He would make things out he, of nothing. He spent a little bit of time in school, but tried to hide that he couldn't read or write. Yeah, right. Would you tell us about Miss Prather? Aaron, would you like to speak to that since he talks so? Sure, sure, I would love to. So Miss Prather was his teacher and she knew that he didn't know how to read and write. He had fallen so far behind because he could only go to school infrequently, sometimes um, uh, maybe once or, once or twice a week, he had fallen behind um, and she knew this. So she didn't call on him to expose the fact in front of other children that he couldn't, he couldn't read or write. Um, instead, he asked, she asked him to draw pictures for the bulletin board. She gave him some chores to do um, around the classroom to help out and contribute to the group. And then she invited him to her house after school to teach her, teach him um, how, how to read and write as best um, as she could communicate that given the small period of time that she had to work with him. Um, and unfortunately, he didn't really learn to read and write until he went to prison. But her kindness was so important to him. It really rescued his sense of self-esteem. And she affirmed his talent as somebody who could draw and as somebody who had something to contribute to the classroom. It was very, very important. And when he remembers her, um, in the book, when he told me about it, you know, it brought tears to his eyes. He was so, so grateful. She really was the first one to discover his artistic talent. I guess you could say that. That's yeah. right. There is a ghastly story about the plantation owner showing the six or seven-year-old Winfred something in the barn. Would one of you share the, what happened? Would, would you like me, Patsy, or do you want to? Yes, you, 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 you go with that. So when he was a little boy, five or six years old, the um, plantation owner called him, called him into the barn and show, showed him some glass jars. And it took him a, a little while looking at these jars to understand that they had people's private parts in them, the private parts of, from men um, that had been 
preserved in these jars and he was uh, showing them to Winfred in order to frighten him, to terrorize him and to intimidate him so that he would, you know, do Stay what he was it. told. It was, it was really traumatic and he was so afraid he didn't feel that he could tell anyone about it. He never talked about it as a child. Um, it was only until he was an adult that he, he shared that terrible memory. Just unbelievable. In chapter three, Hamilton Avenue, Winfred tells us that for every person he paints, he has a movie about them in his head. I love this. What can you tell us about his cinematic approach to painting? It was so interesting to hear him talk about that. You want to say first, Patsy? Uh, well, he would talk about it as if he was reliving it yeah. all over again. And he would get so excited when he would be talking about it. He really, really could see himself there in his mind. He could see himself replaying those scenes and that he drew. He could really... And you remember the people so well and remember the different things that they did. Some stood out more than others, but he really liked it, uh, the uh, Papa Screwball and <laughs> Black Master's son. Oh, that was the good. characters that he said, you know, Walt Dennis would have a ball with some of these people I know. So he got a kick out of it. It was like a movie for him. Yeah, he developed a character study for each of the people he painted. Yes. Aaron, when he was speaking with you about this, um, what was your response to the movie in his head? Well, I was I was blown away blown away by somebody that had somebody that had such a vivid and detailed memory. He would close his eyes, he would start to describe you know, his journey back into the past in his mind and these characters. And then he would become so animated because he was talking about members of the black community who had helped him, who he had befriended him. And he was just so joyous. I think it helped his memories of these people who he created works of art about much later in his life were so important to him his whole life, I think, including in prison to have these memories that he could retreat to and people who comforted him, people who were on his side that could help to sustain him. It was very important, I think, for his whole life. And it, he was just joyous in describing some of these local characters mm -hmm. and, you know, how they danced in the juke joint and they played pool and did all kinds of crazy things. So, Actually, uh, I wondered about making his memoir into a narrative film. I know there have been two documentaries, but um, this is the stuff of which fantastic movies are made in the right hand. It's so visual and there's so many changes in the book. There's so many different episodes. It's so exciting. I think it would make an amazing narrative film. Um, there, the scenes, the artwork, his memories, the characters, his love story with Patsy, his disappointed love story with his mother. I mean, there are just so many interesting themes in addition to, you know, just the, the kind of brutality of his prison experience and his attempt to put himself back to that together, his sense of self-esteem after having spent those years in prison. So there's, um, there's it's so rich, it really is. Among his most exciting works, I think, are those you were referencing, Patsy, Winfrey's pictures of the juke joints, the music clubs, and places on Hamilton Avenue in his hometown of Cuthbert, Georgia. There are eight of these illustrations in chapter three, and each is a masterpiece. How does he achieve the vitality that comes through in those scenes? He's, you're looking at the soul of a man who yearned for 
peace. He, he didn't go by color. He went by how you treat it. And when he, do, when he would do a picture, he would do it from that perspective. It was his soul that he was pouring out on that art, on that canvas. And he, he tried to do it with love and understanding and a, a tool that young people can look back and hopefully this type of thing would never go on and they would have more love for one another. When he was do, when he do these pictures, he's doing them from a point of love and it's his soul that he's pouring out. And it's a cry for help in some, the way I look at some of his work, it's a cry for help for humanity to come back full force. And when you said like a, a movie or uh, uh, some other aspect, he's trying to reach people. He's trying to reach them in a way, even though these are hard times, he made it beautiful for yes. you to look at. Yes. He's captured that. That's his soul that he's putting on those canvases. Oh, the vitality in his soul. The daily indignity and humiliation of Black people's lives in Cuthbert is told and illustrated in the chapter, The Everyday Lie, unimaginable horrors that were regular occurrences. I think the least violent act we read about in that chapter, the least physically violent, it was psychologically abusive, was the laughing barrel. Would you describe it? Oh boy, that's a humiliation, uh, a way to put a black man in his place, so to speak, or put him down or see how much punishment, how much humiliation you can put on a person and nothing be done about it. There's no one to tell. Do whatever you want. <laughs> and he want people to know that these things happen not in slavery time, but now. They happen then in the 60s, in the 70s. It's a uphill battle with an anvil on your back, trying to pull yourself up and someone's repeatedly stepping on you, pushing you back down. He was trying to illustrate that that's a pain, that's a pain that's unbearable to talk about, but yet and still you live through it. So these are the types of things that are, and he wanted people to know that that was a price that's been paid for the freedom that we so casually live now. That was a price that was paid. He did a picture, I don't know whether you've seen it, The Struggle. Yes. And everybody in that picture is some kind of famous person. But he wanted them to know that somebody was abused and mistreated for them to get to that spot, to be able to struggle. And they still have their struggle even today. Oh yes. It's still a struggle. So maybe just to fill out the picture of the laughing barrel a little bit so people can understand the, you know, the scenario. There were whites in the town square who would hang out and they had a big barrel um, that they stood next to. And when Blacks walked through the square, they would tell jokes about them, try to humili humiliate them, and then um, require them to stick their head in the barrel and laugh um, as a way of, um, a form of entertainment for the whites that were hanging out there. So the painting shows this barrel with a few whites around it, a bunch, you know, other members of the community and a black man with his head sticking in the barrel. Unreal. Winfred became interested in the civil rights movement in 1962, I believe. Would you please explain what happened during and after the march 
in which he participated. You or me, Aaron? Um, what, whatever you well, prefer. Let's share it. Let's share it. Okay. Let's share that part. When he he was the type of person who wanted to do something, he wanted to be a part of something that was important. And what he told me, how he got involved, he didn't tell you, Aaron, you're not yet, but he had just got out of the army and uh, he got off the bus in Albany, Georgia. And he saw this crowd of people getting ready to go to America's. Well, America's is where his mother lived. So he thought, well, I'll join these group of people who were going to protest about a certain person who had shot into a crowd, Charlie Hopkins had shot into a crowd of white people and shot one. Uh, I think maybe he might've killed him. And he wanted to uh, show his support for him. So in the meantime, he put her up, his clothes might be still there in the, in the uh, bus station terminal. He put him in the locker and got on the bus, civil rights bus. So now you take it from there. Uh, sure. He attended, in, in my understanding, more than one demonstration in Americas. Um, and the last one was the most violent. Um, there were a big crowd of protesters marching down to the main street and, um, and the officials and unofficial supporters of the officials um, came with guns and dogs and fire hoses and attacked the demonstrators and somebody fired a gun there was mayhem, people were running, and Winford ran down an alley. Um, he knew Americas because, as Patsy mentioned, his mother was from the area. He had spent time in Americas. Um, and when he went down this alley and turned around, he saw two white men with shotguns coming uh, in his direction. Um, and he said, you know, they, they were serious. They weren't there to hunt squirrels. Um, and he saw a, a car with the keys in it on the side of the street. He jumped in the car and he stole it. He drove back to Cuthbert to get away and was sub subsequently arrested. He escaped. Yeah. Please, Pat Patsy. After, after they held him in jail, that's the reason I was saying he was behind bars for nine years almost. They held him in jail for almost two years, it was a year and a half for sure. And that's why he stuffed the uh, commode and, and had it to flood over. Now by doing this, he made the deputy sheriff upset. And the deputy sheriff came into the cell and began to uh, beat him and kick him. And uh, he fought back, physically fought him back and took the gun and escaped from the jail. Now, Aaron? So after he escaped, he went to the home of some people that he knew um, asking for their help. And apparently out of fear, they called the police. Um, so the, the sheriff and other law enforcement officers came to the house where he was um, to his surprise and busted down the door and beat him um, for some time, um, both at the house and back at the police station. Um, and then later on in the evening, um, a mob gathered and they drove him outside of town um, to the woods where um, they pulled off his clothes and um, strung him up in a tree by his feet. Um, he thought he was going to be killed, and uh, he was pretty badly wounded, but not killed. There was someone who intervened and said uh, that they shouldn't kill him. They had better uses for him, and they should take him back to jail. He painted scenes of his torture by these thugs, his near lynching, and another picture called almost me. Patsy, when was he able to tell you about these events? We have been married over five years. 
and he would have nightmares. And he would wake up in a sweat of a rage. And I thought it was from the army. And finally one day he said, I'm gonna tell you why I wake up this way and what's going on. And he told me that he was reliving things that had happened to him. And when he started to explain, he said, you're not gonna believe me. I said, I believe whatever you tell me. He said, you're not gonna believe me. His whole thing was, he was not gonna be believing if he told what happened to him, hmm. if he sat down and explained things that went on, nobody would believe it. So he began to tell me some of the things that happened to him. And me being from the South, this was something that was not far-fetched for me to believe because I was witnessed some things myself. So when he would tell me these stories and they stayed in the back of my mind, while he was having such a hard time, I thought maybe that if he actually told someone other than me, that it would uh, help him in some way. But he was afraid that people would think he was lying. So he just didn't venture out into it until we met. Uh, but it was some years later that we were sitting out here to Sharon and in, in, uh, Phil McBlain's house that he started just telling things that had happened to him that seemed unbelievable, but they happened. Got documentation, some of the people that wasn't too afraid to talk about it did. And to validate what he had to say. And that dual process of telling the stories to you and your friends, the McBlains, whom you met in 1996, I think, thereabouts. Yes. Um, 1990. It was in the 90s, let's just say the 90s. Then, so on the one hand, um, it was healthy for him to be able to get it all out and to paint the scenes. But it also <laughs> stirred up tremendous trauma. And in fact, he experienced more of what you described. He was diagnosed with PTSD. Fortunately, he was treated for it. The but chat, please. It was necessary for him to do what he'd done. It was necessary not only for him, but for a lot of more Black people that come from the South was afraid to talk about the punishment and the horror that they suffered. Him telling this story about himself, he actually told the story of a lot of more black people, black men who were afraid to talk about it. And he's, his whole thing was, if I do this, what is going to be the backlash? That was his word he used, backlash, for me telling my story. He still had a fear that it was going to hurt some people and give some people strength to talk about because he was not the only one that suffered in this manner. But he is the only one so far from that little town decided to tell what happened and how life was. And that life that he lived was for a lot of young black men. Yes. The chapter Finding Patsy contains a beautiful love story, one we can see still lives on in you. I was hoping you would tell us how you met and about your unusual courtship. Oh my Lord. Aaron, would you do me the honors? <laughs> <laughs> it's hard for me to talk about it. Oh, I'm sorry. I get all mushy with it. <laughs> well, you were his salvation. Why don't I say a few things and then you can jump in, Patsy, and fill it okay, out. Okay, please. <laughs> um, so Winfred was working on the road in the chain gang, repairing the road, building bridges and things like that in the community. And there was a bridge that had been washed out near Patsy's house. 
Um, and he was there fixing the bridge and stopped at her house to ask for a glass of water together with one of the, the people that he was working with. And Patsy was in the yard washing clothes. Um, and uh, that was the first time he had a chance to meet her, although he had seen her before. Isn't that right, Patsy? Yes, he had seen me before. <laughs> and I ran from him. And I went in the house and I told my dad that there were some prisoners in the yard. And my daddy came to the door with his shotgun and said, what do you boys want? He said, we just want some water. We're working on the bridge down here to help get y'all in and out. And my mother came and looked over my dad's shoulder and said, hey, you boys working down there? He said, yes, ma'am, we sure are. She said, well, come up here at 12 and I'll have dinner for you. Mm. So now I got a chance to look at him and he got a chance to look at me. <laughs> so he started to uh, stop my school bus and he would put a whole lot of dirt because he used one of those heavy equipment machines and he would put a whole lot of dirt in the road the bus school bus couldn't get by and he would get down off his machine he said write me girl come on write me write me girl so I never would write him but finally he wrote me and that started the romance after reading his letters and I started sneaking I wasn't permitted but my grandmother lived up the street from the camp. So I would go over to her house on Sundays, comb her hair and ask, can I go to the store? Then I'd cut across the field and come down to the road and go up to the camp to see her. She never got a cold soda. <laughs> <laughs> Sneak out to see him. And um, Remarkable that Patsy, sa Patsy saved those letters. Yes. Oh all the years over all the years um and she shared them with me i read them and we included a couple of them in chasing me to my grave they um, are were just beautiful and they that was part of your love story wasn't it not patsy yes he was just even then to me he was magnificent i used to watch him just to see him i just wanted to see him i couldn't talk to him all the time but he was just it was just something about him that charmed me. How did he win over your parents? I mean, here they were distrustful. How did he win them over? He wrote a letter. My father had been, after they caught me, they told me I couldn't see him no more and I couldn't go out there. And uh, he wrote a letter and my father intercepted the letter. And he read, he fooled me. I thought he was reading the Bible and he was reading the letter. <laughs> and after he got through reading the letter, he said, girl, put on some clothes. I didn't know what he was talking about. He said, make yourself look presentable. My mother took off her apron in the kitchen. She stopped cooking and they got in the car and took me to see him from one letter that he wrote that they read. And my father said, I've got to meet him now to see if he mean any of these things he's saying. But um, it was a lot more in there than what I'm saying now. But uh, he won them over with kindness and with an understanding that he meant me no harm. He talked about your mother being a gourmet cook oh. and <laughs> a beauty and quite, quite an interesting lady. I love his portrait of her. Um, and he mentions that she only wanted to be called Sugar Cane. That was yeah. her nickname. How did he portray her? Oh, they got to be. That's a picture of her. She was really a stunning woman. And I wanted to be her. I just didn't want to be like her. I wanted to be her because she had such a way about herself that made you feel like she was important all the time. She was important. She didn't dress like that all the time, but when she did dress, you took notice. And uh, you would have thought that was his mother, not mine. They got to be such good friends. He just, he had that charm that he charmed her and my father. Well, the both the description and the painting are gorgeous. 
So you met the McLeans in the early 90s. Why did that mark a turning point in your lives? Well, I like to say the Lord put them in my path to help guide us, help uh, open doors for us, help us to raise our children. They also was there for moral support. When things got tough, they helped us out always, always. And uh, I, I just thank God that I met them. Would you tell us about Winfred's first show, You or Patsy, how it came about? So Phil McBlain had encouraged Winfred to try out his talent as an artist after Winfred had carved a small carved and dyed a small painting and given it to Phil McBlain. Um, Phil was very impressed by it, ended up selling it and giving the money to Winfred and um, bought Winfred all this leather and tools and said, try to do some stories you know, on, on leather, Tell, do some more pictures. This is really good stuff. Um, and Patsy was encouraging Winfred to do stories of a personal nature on leather. Um, to depict his own memories and scenes from his life. So with Phil and Patsy's support, Winfred began to carve and tool leather and dye it um, and created um, a, a number of uh, stunning early paintings that were recognized by um, a, a local person who supported artists and decided to host a small show in New Haven to introduce Winfred to the community and to recognize his talent. And that was really, that was really the beginning. Um, and do you wanna talk about what, what happened at that show, Patsy? There was a kind of interesting moment uh, when Winfred overheard one of the oh, yes. people at the show talking about the paintings. Uh, he, was, he was surprised that everybody was looking at the work that he did of his memory and not of the Martin Luther King and the people that he had drew of prominence. So he heard this guy tell him, that, well, he walked up to him and told him he was, cause Wilbert was talking to me and this white guy heard him ask me why was they looking at his pictures of people they don't know that's not famous. And the guy told him, we want what's in your head. We want to see what you do, but you know, we can get those pictures anywhere. And that and changed his view. Winfred right was so astounded that here this white man was interested in scenes of ordinary people in Cuthbert, Georgia, you know, shooting pool or um, dancing um, rather than somebody who was famous. And that was a, he, and, but he got it. He really got it when <laughs> he, the man that, said it. That really, because I had been after him for years to do things like that, but he, he just didn't think anyone would be interested. He was gonna buy my work. Well, what did that show lead to? <laughs> so it, it, it turned into that Jock Reynolds got an opportunity to see what was work and then put on a bigger show for him. And that's what got the notoriety. Yeah, yeah. Jock Reynolds uh, got Yale to uh, put an art show on for him. And it lasted a month and then he had to redo it. I think it was three or two, three shows they did. But with all of the honors, some glamorous parties and receptions in New York, Winford's homecoming in Cuthbert, Georgia, was the most meaningful to him. The, the validation of coming back as a hero and, and having risen above all of the sadness that had come his way. Tony, I see you're on. I just wanted to ask one more thing. In 2013, there was a celebration of the 50th anniversary of the Americas movement and Winfred was honored. What's special about that event that takes us to the venue hosting us now? 
it was his feeling. He left in chains, in chains, and he come back victorious. That was part of how you say it. I don't want to misquote him, but that was a relief of that he was somebody. When he come back to that particular show that was in America where he got beat, sh shot at, and he left there and went to Husband. And he left Georgia in chains and he come back victorious. I think that was what that show meant to him. Not only, oh, not only did he come back victorious, but he was honored at a dinner that was commemorating the 50th anniversary of the Americas movement, which had started in uh, 1963, so this is 2013. And here he had dinner with Jimmy and Rosalind Carter and Patsy was there. It was such a thrill as far mm -hmm. as I understood from what Winfred had to say about it, that it was this remarkable homecoming. He was so overwhelmed by the fact that he was sitting at the table <laughs> with the former president and his wife and Rosalind really loved his work, really, really loved it. Yes. Oh, that comes through so beautifully. Well, Winford wrote about some of the gruesome acts against his friends in Cuthbert and about a man named Buck in particular. And Winfred said, Buck lived for me so that I could tell his story and then I could get back to Cuthbert and he could tell it, he could tell it. Things really happened. They are a part of black history and of our collective American history. Patsy Rembert, Aaron Kelly, this book is extraordinary and it has been such an honor to talk with you both, thank you. Oh, it's been such an honor to be here and to introduce the, the book through the Carter Library is very special. And I wish Winfred were here to enjoy that. He would have loved it. Yes, this was a privilege. Well, we're, we're, not, we're not through yet though. Um, I've got uh, some questions from, from viewers and I want to remind folks they can put uh, their questions in the Q&A box. Um, one of my own before we get to the first question is, did, did it change? Did celebrity change him as, as a person? No. He was still the same lovable Winfrey he's always been. And now, when you said change him, it was more than one. One or two of them might have been changed, but he had multiple personalities. Uh, we didn't talk about the picture, did we? All of me. Yeah. All me. So he was always a sweet and kind person. And uh, I, the only thing that this work done was gave him more money to spend on his children and me and to give us a little better life than what we were living. But it didn't change his personality in any way. What you saw was basically what you got. He was always friendly until he didn't have to something caused them not to be friendly. He, he, he was just a beautiful person. One of our, our viewers wrote in, Tricia wrote in, um, saying that she would love to see the, the uh, Chasing Meat of the Grave uh, made into a movie and wondered, Patsy, who you would want to portray him and who to portray you. Oh, well, uh, I, I would, I want it, but he's no longer here now, so he can't portray him. But uh, they would just have to look. I would like for, uh, I think her name, she plays, uh, I think her last name is White. She played in Jingles. Do you remember that picture? Jingle? No. Oh, yeah. 
Yeah. The actors um, that, I can't think I, of the name. I can't recall. Viola this, Davis. How about Viola Davis? Of course, we'd have to have different age actors, wouldn't we? Look at me. Well, I'm I think a she casting director. From, she looks so good and she's so young. I think she could play it from beginning to end. <laughs> from the time that, um, what is her name? Little Whites. Uh, she played in Jingle. She got a lot of movies out and she got a, a series that's on. Um, um, I cannot think of her name right now. I don't know. No. It just escapes me. Well, then, an, another question was, um, whose art did he look up to? Well, tell you the truth, before he started, he, he didn't look up to anyone, but uh, he did after he started getting into the art world. Uh, Jacob Lawrence. He, he, he admired him and uh, Ruben Cob uh, Cobra Rubis. He liked his work. But uh, before then, art was not something that he followed. He just did doodles and stuff like that in his own work. He was not following any artists. Right at the beginning, he came across Miguel Rubius's Negro drawings. And yeah. was very impressed because uh, Cobra Rubius portrayed Black people dancing, singing in kind of ordinary life situations. Um, and he uh, did a copy of one of the Cobra, Rubius, Cobra Rubius paintings, which was his first work of art. Um, so that was a kind of a defining moment for him. And I think Cobra Rubius influenced a number of his paintings and somewhat his style. Um, and which evolved into Winfred Rembert's own personal wonderful style that's unique and original. But Cobra, Cobra Rubius did influence him in that early, yeah. early moment. Yeah, I was I was intrigued when Lois was talking not only about um, uh, Winfred growing up in the area where President and Mrs. Carter uh, grew up uh, south of. Of planes, but you look at the the timeline. He goes to prison in sixty seven. So it's it's year before Martin Luther King is killed. There's um, Vietnam is a big issue, but in seventy four when he's released, that's three years after. Governor Jimmy Carter has talked about um, the time for racial discrimination is over, uh, but still in this state, that sort of thing was still going on. And, and it's the, the kinds of things that he, he, uh, his artwork depicts uh, had led up all through that time, just in the, in the neighborhood where uh, President and Mrs. Carter uh, grew up. Yeah, well, there's a lot of brutality in prisons all over this country right up until this very day. It really never ended. Yeah. Um, before he died, the Black Lives Matter movement had really taken hold. What were his thoughts of that? You mean about uh, the Black Lives Matters? Uh, well, that was a, something that was going on all the time. It, that's not, not, that was not you to him because we've always, Blacks have always been treated badly by police. But uh, he just thought all lives mattered. Mm -hmm. He really did. But the, the, the brutality that you see now that they got cameras to show, that was all through his life. He was used to being abused and mistreated and seeing others Blacks stop for no reason, incarcerated. There's people in jail today that's Black that didn't do nothing, but they had no way out. So the brutality that we're witnessing now didn't just start now. It's an ongoing thing. It's ongoing. It's not new. Yeah. Um, what, what did he hope that his artwork would make people think about? 
Did he tell you, Aaron? I think he wanted people to understand, remember, commemorate ordinary people who had sacrificed to try to make a change. Um, just ordinary people in Georgia who not only endured um, humiliation and injustice, but took action to try to change things for the better, sometimes at great uh, cost to themselves. Um, so I think he wanted to, he wants to share some images of people he felt proud of who, who stood up, spoke out, and um, tried to make things better. Um, so I think his artwork is a kind of window onto life in Georgia that we can learn a lot from and his story, um, which goes into the detail of ordinary life for him and many other people in a small town in Southwest Georgia um, is, a, is a testimony of, um, of that period in our history, which is very closely connected to the present. Um, and I think he wanted people to think about the fact that this was not so long ago that what he experienced happened, um, that he lived through it and that it was important to talk about it. And he wants people to talk about history. Um, that's what one of the things that he said um, that was important and both his art and his story speak to that. But he seems to be talking about it without bitterness and I don't know how you do that. It's the way he was. Or how he was able to do that. He, he had a, a sense of love. He wanted to be loved and he wanted to love everybody. He wanted everybody to love him. So he didn't speak from things from a... a he, he always spoke from the point of view, you can learn from this. This was wrong, but that's the way you thought it should have went. Now is the time to change. Do it differently so that we all can just live together in peace. Yeah. One thing I, before we go, because Patsy, is, it is really an honor to have you here, especially um, Brian Stevenson writes in his foreword to the book um, about the award that his organization was giving. He had uh, Winford and, and you go to New York and um, Winford's supposed to talk to the group and Brian is thinking okay he's got all of these stories that he can tell about the Jim Crow South and according to, to Brian's uh, forward he says instead he dedicated his remarks to the love of his life his wife Patsy he was both effusive and shy as he praised her he expressed his love and ador ador uh, adoration for Patsy so honestly and genuinely. I saw couples around the room squeeze each other's hands. It was a tender and romantic and generous and humble and most of all, beautiful. When Patsy joined him on stage after Winford begged her to stand beside him, he beamed with joy and the audience cheered. You were quite an influence on him. He was such an influence on me. Passy Rimbert, Aaron Kelly, thank you very much. Uh, Lois, as always, thank you. Um, and also just to remind our, our uh, viewers that this program is being recorded. It will be on our the Carter Library Facebook page, Acapella Facebook page. And Lois, it's going to be on your show. Uh, the audio version is coming up on, on your show as well, I believe. Yes. And I just cannot say enough about this magnificent book and the stories that are in it. Thank you. Al Capella Books has copies of the book uh, with autographed book plates that you can get uh, just by going to their website. So um, Aaron, Patsy, Lois, thank you all very much. Thank you for joining us. And we look forward to uh, being with you all again on another one of our author programs with Al Capella Books. Have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you. Such an honor and pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank Thanks. you. Thanks so much. Thanks.